When it comes to social media, we all have to manage multiple identities, just like superheroes. Crafting our communication in online personas can foster collaboration and connection with a multitude of others. Yet it can also lead to increased stress, feelings of inadequacy, and distraction. I'm Matt Abrahams, and I teach strategic communication at Stanford Graduate School of Business. Welcome to Think Fast, Talk Smart, the podcast. Today, I look forward to my conversation with Jeff Hancock. Jeff is the founding director of the Stanford Social Media Lab and a professor in the Department of Communication. His research and teaching seek to understand psychological and interpersonal processes in social media, like trust, deception, relationships, and emotion. Welcome, Jeff. Hi, Matt. Really looking forward to uh, talking with you today. Great. I look forward to learning from you as well. Let's get started. Social media allows us to communicate so much about ourselves, our beliefs, our ideas, desires, hopes, fears, and most importantly, our identities. What insights has your lab found regarding how we disclose information about ourselves? Well, I love the way you start that question out with all of the different things that we, that we need to do when we talk about ourselves. We need to express ourselves and share our identity and identify with other people. And all of those things that we've been studying in psychology and communication for decades, they still apply in social media. Mm -hmm. So the one big thing I would say I would take away after maybe 15 years of doing work on this is that psychology trumps technology. Hmm. If you want to understand what's going on in social media, the first place to start is with what's going on psychologically. Most of what we see online uh, is people, you know, accomplishing their goals, trying to carry out their motivations some of those things get changed and the scale is like nothing we've ever seen mm -hmm. but it still comes back to this idea of there's no need to throw out the book of psychology or the book of communication when we go online i see so leveraging what we already know can help us just in this different medium to to accomplish our goals Right. I think whenever there's a, a new kind of technology, especially one that that takes over so dominantly and so quickly as something like social media, um, our focus is on the technology and, and what it's doing. Uh, but I think over time, what we end up realizing is that um, it's people that that matter and we're using it to accomplish things. Um, and I think when we start to when we step back from kind of some of the moral panic about what's happening with social media, um, we can get a sense of what really is changing. So I think we are communicating with, with far more people. Um, more kinds of people can get access to us. Mm -hmm. That's sort of one of the economic uh, outcomes is that, you know, somebody in Russia can pay a small amount of money to get their information in front of me uh, in social media. So there are real changes, but uh, we as humans, our goals, our motivations, our needs and desires, they, they have not. I see. Yeah. So how does social media affect our well-being? And do you have any suggestions on how we can maximize the positive impact? This is such a huge question. And when we see, you know, movies like The Social Dilemma come out mm -hmm. and, and, and become really popular, I think it, it uh, reflects how much people care about this. And, and anytime I'm at a a dinner party, you know, back when we could do that before the pandemic. Right. Um, parents, you know, genuinely, you know, would pull me over and just say, hey, can you tell me, like, what do I do with my kids? You know, so uh, <laughs> I'm all ears. I've got two kids right? myself. Yes. Yeah, it is a it is a huge question. So let me do a, a, a couple of things. One is uh, my research group has looked at all the research over the last um, uh, 12 years, going back to 2006 and done what's called a meta analysis where mm -hmm. we look at, you know, every study. Uh, that's been done and put them together and sort of statistically um, uh, blend them up. And what we end up finding is really very small effects. So the more you use social media, counting it by number of times or how many hours a day, is is at best only weakly correlated with um, with with things like depression or anxiety or even on the positive side like life satisfaction or social connectedness. And so the first thing to say is that we're not seeing overall any huge massive effects. And this is the same with say TV, which was the last big thing people were really worried about. There right. were many, many hundreds of studies. Yeah. Showing like, oh my gosh, we're going to destroy our kids. Their brains are being melted and you know, nobody's really worried about that now. So I think something similar is here is 
yeah, social media matters. It's, it, it, it is related to our well-being, but there's not massive effects. And how is it related? I think when our data shows that if you use social media a lot, you might get a little bit more depressed, small effects, a little bit more anxious, mm -hmm. but you also get a, a little bit of a larger increase in social well-being, so how connected you feel. So that's the first step is just like, okay, we can sort of curb the fear a little bit that mm -hmm. there may be some effects, but they're not very big. The other is it's not clear that it's all say social media doing it to us. Some of the data we see is that when we're feeling bad, for example, mm -hmm. we might be more likely to go on social media and connect with people. Um, and so it, it, it's, it, I love the way you asked the question because it's neither good nor bad in my view. I think uh, much like you know you and I you and I talking, if you said, well, Jeff, these ideas are just stupid, mm -hmm. <laughs> that that wouldn't be great for my well-being. I'd probably feel a little bit uh, sad. And <laughs> I would never hurt. do that, Jeff. I know you're such a nice guy, but <laughs> when you say things like that that are positive and supportive, then I feel really good. And so, social media again is is it's not necessarily unique, and it's not going to affect us in one direction only. I think that it can increase how connected we feel. Mm -hmm. And because we know more information about what's going on in our social world, it might increase our anxiety and we have to sort of balance those trade-offs. So I have to say a big sigh of relief that, that my worry about my, my kids getting sucked into this never ending vortex of social media uh, is, is perhaps misplaced. So thank you for that. And it sounds like we can leverage social media to help us, to help us connect, to help us manage when we feel down, uh, and we just have to be mindful that it could potentially uh, also exacerbate some things like depression and anxiety. I think that's the right way to put it. It's, it's really a learning curve and we're at the very beginning of it, but we see young people learning really fast. And yes, are they gonna <laughs> make mistakes? Are they gonna have bad experiences? Yes, they will. Uh, it's part of, of growing and it's especially part of being an adolescent. So ad adults are going to have this experience too where we we make an error. We've all probably done that. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but the core point there is that we are learning. We, we do get better. We adapt. And um, I think that um, we'll, we'll, we'll be increasingly better at and using this as a tool to accomplish our goals rather than, you know, letting it, you know, drive what we're doing. I, I think I'd make one other point, and this is especially important for parents, is it's really easy for us to focus on time because it's something that we can see and we can measure. Mm -hmm. And and as hard as this is, I, I'd like us to move away from time if possible to start thinking about what we're doing, what our kids are doing and who they're doing it with. You could mm -hmm. imagine saying, well, you're only allowed to have an hour on social media and that hour could be spent doing something like connecting with old friends at an old school or doing something creative on TikTok, like making cool new videos or it could spend stalking someone or, <laughs> right. you know, paying attention, you know, being bullied. Yeah. And so the same hour, right, can have very, very different um, well-being effects. And so I think we have to move away from just time and, and towards what you were saying, like, what are we doing? Who are we doing it with? And, and, and what are we engaging with? And that's going to be much more important as we teach kids uh, how to become better sort of um, social media users. Well, and I think it also can help us as adults to think about how we use our time, too. Uh, one of the distinctions I'd like to make here is that, you know, you've, we've talked a lot about what social media can be for us as users, but social media also opens us up to very large audiences, and that sometimes can bring with it immediate and vicious feedback. Do you have any insights on how we can avoid the potential venom and trolling that, that social media has brought to us? It's a great question because it still just flabbergasts me how much negativity uh, can be out there in toxic discourse. Now, it's not everywhere, and, and, and most of social media is, is very positive, but there is just still a, a, a shocking amount in weirdest places. I, I'll go on and look at, say, a hockey game review, and the comments will start getting into like political things and, and people showing each other. It's, it's really crazy. So how do you protect yourself? Well. Mm -hmm. The one reason that it's initially difficult is because we're really um, attuned to what other people say about us. And um, this is important. It's it's important about managing our reputations. We, we want to get a sense of how people are perceiving us and talking about us so that we can manage that. 
But it gets a little out of whack when um, these larger audiences can say things about us in ways that we can uh, actually hear. So um, if Matt Abrams says, well, Jeff Hancock um, is really um, mean and never never writes me back. <laughs> okay, so that, that's something that I should care about because he's a colleague of mine at Stanford and we have a working relationship and a, a reputation and, um, you know, and we like each other. Okay. Uh, if Starboy Starboy three eight two says that Jeff Hancock's a real <laughs> jerk, right. right? And I have no idea who that is. Um, I never uh, have any expectation of interacting with them in the future. Um, it's actually initially hard for me to react differently to Starboy three four two than it is to Matt Abrams, even though, you know, theoretically, intellectually, we know. Okay, well, right. we should care about Matt differently. But when we go online and especially places like Twitter, uh, other uh, public places where it's not, um, you know, it's not sort of our social networks alone, but anybody, uh, we have a hard time doing that. And so one of the things I work with with clients is to think about who they want to know about. So if there's specific mm -hmm. relationships, focusing on those. If you want to get overall sentiment, well, there are now computational tools that abound for aggregating across populations or segments. Oh, I see. So I think it's really, yeah, much more about stepping back and turning off that automatic reaction we have to when people talk about us. Interesting. Yes. In an earlier podcast episode, we had a conversation with Alison Kluger, who, who talks about reputation management, and it feeds nicely into what you're talking about. It's uh, being very purposeful in how you want to portray your reputation, but also how you want to assess it. So, so getting feedback is really important in forming a reputation, but you want to make sure you're, that feedback's coming from a meaningful place and people that you, you support. So the importance of language and wording has come up several times on this podcast across multiple episodes. Uh, when we've discussed various topics like persuasion, power, and reputation, uh, wording matters a lot. What have you learned about language and word choice in social media? Are there any best practices? This is um, just such a rich area right now because... Uh, you know, for most of human history, everything that we said disappeared. And we had to work as scientists really hard to capture what people said to understand what mattered. And now <laughs> so much of what we say gets captured. So we can study perception, we can study trust, <laughs> right. emotion, presentation. So yeah, the, it turns out it does matter. I've been doing some work with my former PhD student, uh, Dave Markowitz, who's now at University of Oregon, and he's led this huge project on authenticity. And I'll mm -hmm. just tell you a little bit about his study to give you a sense. He measured authenticity. We can use this tool that measures it and includes things like self-reference and um, emotion and concreteness in language. Basically, it's this sort of way of computing the authentic style. And in this amazing set of studies, I mean, this is what Dave is so amazing at, is finding kind of like naturally mm -hmm. produced data. He looked at it in conversations, in uh, TED Talks, and then on Shark Tank. Hmm. And found that, um, for example, in the Shark Tank, people that presented with uh, authentic uh, style of language production were more likely to get um, funded. Um, hmm. We find that with TED Talks, the more authentic the TED Talk language, the more comments and the more views. And then even when we do in a study where we get people to talk to one another and then rate each other. So as your uh, podcast has found many times, uh, language matters. And especially in social media, because... Um, unlike here, where it sort of disappears unless you, you know, hit rewind, um, your language in social media sits as a testament to who you are. It, it stands in for, for you. And so, yeah, it really, really matters. And I think people being thoughtful about their style and, and, and communicating in a way that they feel really honest about. It's hard to tell people to change the way they talk because we're right. so natural. And I think it's easy to pick up on that, but um, wow, you can really tell the difference between someone who's a natural and who's not. For instance, I find communicating in social media kind of stressful and I'm not, I don't think I'm very talented, whereas other people I know, it, it comes very naturally. So uh, it's something we can work on, um, uh -huh. but uh, ultimately um, we have to be true to how we sound and, and how we think. So 
the fact that authenticity uh, reigns supreme in social media, just like it does in other types and other forms of communication, is to me really inspiring and it brings great comfort that there isn't some new unique way of having to communicate it's really finding what works for you and and authentically conveying it and and that means all of the practices that have been around for 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 years and years and years can can come to bear to be helpful so that that's good to know good to know yeah it it goes back to you know psychology trumps technology yes Um, yes yes and people that are authentic or self-aware they behave in ways that match you know their needs they communicate openly and that doesn't go away just because we're in social media. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and as you've said, it stays around a long time because it's, right. it's uh, captured. Yeah. Any last best practices or advice to being better at communicating via social media? I'd say there's um, three main things uh, that I share when I'm you know, working with clients. Uh, the first is to back to this authenticity thing. So you, you need to communicate in a way that is trustworthy for you, that when other people see that, they're like, okay, this person is trustworthy. They're, they're reliable. They're going to do, for instance, what they say they're going to do in the way they say they're going to do it. That's one. Mm-hmm. The second is to come from a place of competence. Um, mm-hmm. Influencers are successful typically because they have some competency. So we've been looking a lot at uh, beauty influencers and, these women, typically women, just know so much. It's it's amazing. And they often are kind of niche and they just have this like exquisite um, expertise in an area. And that's why people are attracted to various channels and influencers is that confidence. The third is timing. This is especially true for traditional companies, brick and mortar places, mm-hmm. banks and insurance companies, everybody right, that wants to become more digital is they often have a real focus on customer service. We're going to get back to our customers quickly, like within a day. And that's probably a day too late. And when we move into online and social media settings, time just operates at a different scale. And so I think for um, you know, for clients, it's it's that communicating in an authentic, trustworthy way. It's about you know coming from a place of competence and, and then time, responsiveness, is so much faster in social media. And if you don't scale up to that, then you're going to run into disappointment. All right. So I've got an acronym for you, ACT, Authenticity, Competence, and Timing. And those are the key ingredients to help you act more effectively in social media. So great tips. Thank you. Right on. Trademark Uh, that. (laughs) (laughs) It's going up on my Twitter right now. Um, (laughs) Before we end, uh, I'd like to ask you the same three questions I ask everyone. Sound okay? Sounds good. Okay. If you were to capture the best communication advice you have ever received as a five to seven word presentation slide title, what would it be? Well, I, 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 is it okay if I do less than five? You can do (laughs) that. Hey, that's great. You're talking, you're, you're talking good social media. Uh, Make sure it's, it's concise and clear. Concise and clear. Yeah. Well, this comes from, you know, elementary school, high school, my PhD advisor, um, everybody that I've seen that gives great talks, you know, and that's tell a story, uh-huh. tell a story. And, and I, you know, I think about this with my grad students when we're writing science papers too, it's, it doesn't have to be like a narrative, like, well, I woke up today and this is right. what I'm or, or anything clever, but it has to be a story for people to be able to, you know, connect with it and grasp it. And so, um, that skill of, of taking almost anything that you have and turning it into a story is one that really works well in social media. Uh, It just, it engages, it allows you to stand out from, you know, the the bluster uh, that's out there. Um, But stories, um, stories are what work and and they can be short. Mm -hmm. Um, So I, 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 that would be my advice. Just tell a story. Uh, I love it, and I think it's wonderful. Most of us, or many of us, have have fallen victim to capturing things as bullet points and lists, and it just doesn't resonate the same way, and stories right. can be very powerful. I'll be curious to hear how you answer the second question. Who is a communicator that you admire, and why? Well, I was curious about that, too. Uh, <laughs> so I've been thinking about it for the last uh, couple of days. Uh, and I've got a number of people, so I'm going to cheat a little bit. Okay. Um, 
I'm going to start with somebody who I think is a really great social media communicator, but also a good communicator in general. And that's my brother, my younger brother, huh. Darcy Hancock. His Instagram uh, thing is Darcy.j.hancock. And <laughs> he, he's, he calls himself a retired guitar player. He's, you know, a rock star up in Canada, also a barber. But he's one of those people that just communicates in social media so easily, so authentically humorous, uh, funny, but also can be serious. You know, when he sees things that are, are wrong, he calls it out. But most of the time, it's just um, fun and supportive and, and joyous. So he's just a really uh, amazing guy. And, you know, as a barber, he's obviously a very skilled communicator as well, but just hmm. fantastic. But then I was thinking, well, I should probably also have an academic in there. <laughs> um, so I was going to suggest another podcaster of yours, uh, Lori Santos. She's the um, uh, happiness podcast mm -hmm. um, person and, and a friend of mine. And I just love the way she talks. I, I could listen to her talk uh, nonstop. I don't have a good reason why other than she's smart, mm -hmm. straightforward, simple, tells lovely stories. And then the last is uh, one thing in my lab we've been trying to work on is, is diversity of perspective. So in my field and in social media research in general, there are very few mm -hmm. um, black scientists, very few scholars of color. And so I want to highlight a colleague that I just did a, a panel with. I think she's amazing. Her name is Courtney Cogburn. She's a professor uh, at Columbia, and she's done this amazing uh, piece with my colleague here, Jeremy Balenson in VR called A Thousand Cuts. You go inside and you you get to experience what racism is like when you're a young male uh, black man from you know being a boy or growing up to being a teenager these sort of three episodes and so she's just an amazing communicator in the sense of both the way she uh, presents her work and how important race is mm -hmm. as a central thing but if you if, you, if you're um audience has time if they could find a, a version of a thousand cuts which i think you can see online now mm -hmm. it's really a, quite an amazing story and, and very impactful so those would be the three that came to my mind sorry to cheat on you a little bit there, but. no you, you did a great job on on being very uh concise on question one so we'll give you a little bit on question two there so <laughs> so we'll see how you do on this third question so question three uh, what are the first three ingredients that go into a successful communication recipe from your perspective right so first is structure mm -hmm. i think that that's really important um the second is story which is sort of mm -hmm. related and the third is uh your audience mm -hmm. we too often forget as as we were talking about earlier that the audience matters we are we are not uh islands in the stream despite Mm -hmm. uh, Dolly and Rogers, uh, great song. Uh, <laughs> but we, we, we communicate together. Everything mm -hmm. we do is a collaboration and a joint action. And so, uh, we have to think about our audience as kind of collaborators, the structure of what it is we want to do. I think that's where I spend most of my work mm -hmm. and time when I'm doing talks. And then, like I said before, telling the story. That's great. And I think all of those are actually building blocks. If you start with your audience, that can lead you to the structure you have, which can ultimately lead you to the story that you need to tell for that audience. So thank you for that. And thank you, Jeff, for sharing your work, your passion for social media. And it's been fascinating to, to better understand how social media is impacting us and our communication. And thank you also for the best practices and guidance that you provided. Thank you, Matt. Really enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to Think Fast, Talk Smart, the podcast, a production of Stanford Graduate School of Business. To learn more, go to gsb.stanford.edu. Please download other episodes wherever you find your podcast.